this is perhaps the last of the graphing videos, uh, and then I want to move on to the next topic. Same thing as always, let's get the domain range, everything else. So I'll go right to the domain. And you should remember that cosine of x and sine of x are defined for all real numbers. Therefore, the only way we're going to run into any trouble is if there are any zeros in the denominator. That means if I had any solutions to this equation, if I subtract 2, so 2 plus sine of x equal to 0, if I subtract 2, I get sine of x equals negative 2. Since sine of x does not go lower than negative 1, there's no solutions to this. So, there's no zeros in the denominator. That means the domain of this function is all real numbers. So we'll just say negative infinity to infinity. Now, where is the thing 0 equal to 0 at? So, if I were to set this equation equal to 0, I would multiply by 2 plus sine of x to get cosine of x is equal to 0. And cosine of x is 0 whenever x is an odd multiple of pi over 2. So maybe you've seen an answer like this before, something like 2k plus 1 times pi over 2, where k is any integer. You may have seen that. And then for the y int, I'll set x equal to 0. So f of 0 equals cosine of 0 all over 2 plus sine of 0, which equals 1 over 2 plus 0, just 1 half. All right, now, you have an infinite number of x-intercepts. You only, of course, only have the one y-intercept. These functions, what makes the trigonometric functions useful is their periodicity. The fact is that cosine has a period of pi over, or 2 pi. Sine of x has a period of 2 pi. So it's possible this whole function has a period of 2 pi. So with that in mind, it, you know, the, the function itself will have period no more than 2 pi. With that in mind, I can focus my attention. Let's focus on just the interval 0 to 2 pi. Then what I can do is, whatever the period is, it'll, be, it'll, it'll divide into 2 pi. So if we double graph, that's no big deal. Anyways, whatever we get on 0 to 2 pi, then I can just copy it over and over and over again, and that's the way the graph will look in perpetuity. So, I'm going to convert my x-intercepts to just the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So with this in mind, my x-intercepts are going to be pi over 2 and 0. That's an odd multiple of pi over 2. In fact, that's 1 times pi over 2, comma, 3 pi over 2, comma, 0. And the y int is 0, comma, 1 half. So I'm going to focus my attention here, and then if I have to, I'll just copy the same graph over and over and over again for as long as required by whoever is checking this particular graph. So I got my intercepts, I got my domain. Let's go ahead and go take the first derivative. Now remember, they take the derivative of the numerator first. Since the numerator was cosine of x, its derivative is negative sine of x. Leave the denominator alone, 2 plus sine of x. Minus, now leave the cosine of x alone and take the derivative of 2 plus sine of x, and you'll get cosine of x.
and all of that is over 2 plus sine of x squared. Let me multiply out and simplify a little bit. I'll get negative 2 sine of x minus sine squared of x minus cosine squared of x. All over 2 plus sine of x squared. Now you should recognize, you know that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. I could factor the negative out of those two terms to have minus sine squared plus cosine squared. And so when I simplify, I'm going to have negative 2 sine of x minus 1 all over 2 plus sine of x squared. Now, there's no places where it's undefined. Just 2 plus sine of x is never 0. So the denominator will, in fact, always be a positive number. The numerator could be 0 some places. So let me go ahead and set that equal to 0. I'll add 1 and divide by negative 2 to get sine of x equals negative 1 half. Now one thing that can help you remember what x values are, this is good for is that you should remember that sine of x is negative in quadrants 3 and quadrants 4. And whenever sine is the 1 half, that means cosine must have been radical 3 over 2. So these happen at pi over 6s. The pi over 6 that happens in quadrant 3 is 7 pi over 6. And the pi over 6 that happens in quadrant 4 is 11 pi over 6. So my critical numbers for f prime I have 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Let me go ahead and do my number line with those numbers on it. It begins at 0 and ends at 2 pi. Now, here's an interesting thing. The fact is that at 0, while it's the end of the interval, the function is doing something. It could be decreasing, decreasing there, because 0 was not a critical number. 0 is not and no kind of pi over 6. So at 0, while we are actually at 0, it's going to be doing whatever is occurring in this whole region here. And it won't change until I would get back to negative pi over 6. So I can actually plug in 0 if I want to. If I plug in 0 for x into the derivative, I will get negative 2 sine of 0 minus 1. Well, sine of 0 is 0. So I will end up with negative 1 over a positive number that will be negative and will be decreasing. Now, 7 pi over 6 is in the third quadrant. 11 pi over 6 is in the fourth quadrant pick something in between, I think the easiest thing to pick is probably x equals 3 pi over 2. And let me plug that in. When x is 3 pi over 2, sine of x is negative 1. So I'll have positive 2 minus 1 will be 1 over a positive number. So I'll be increasing on that interval. And finally, 2 pi. I chose 2 pi because, and 0, I like 0 because if I throw in 2 pi, it just clears out sine. Sine, is zero, sine of 2 pi is 0. So I'll have a negative 1 over a positive number, and it will be negative again. So it's decreasing. So at 7 pi over 6, it looks like I have a local min. And 11 pi over 6, I have a local max. Let me find the y values for those. f of 7 pi over 6 equals cosine 
of 7 pi over 6 divided by 2 plus sine of 7 pi over 6. Cosine is strongest at the pi over 6s. This is a third quadrant angle. Cosine is negative in the third quadrant. So this whole thing equals negative radical 3 over 2. Sine is also negative in the third quadrant. Sine is weaker at the pi over 6s. So I have 2 minus 1 half. Well, let me simplify a little bit. I have negative radical 3 over 2 divided by 3 halves. And that simplifies to negative radical 3 over 3. Now f of 11 pi over 6 equals cosine of 11 pi over 6 divided by 2 plus sine of 11 pi over 6. 11 pi over 6 is in the fourth quadrant. Cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant, so I'll get a positive radical 3 over 2 divided by sine is negative in the fourth quadrant, so I'll get 2 minus 1 half. That will equal radical 3 over 2. 2 divided by 3 halves, and that equals positive radical 3 over 3. So, I have a local min, of, what was it, 7 pi over 6 comma negative radical 3 over 3, and I have a local max, of 11 pi over 6 comma positive radical 3 over 3. Increasing and decreasing. Where is the thing increasing? That I believe, there it was, between 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So it's increasing on 7 pi over 6 comma 11 pi over 6. Decreasing decreasing on 0 to 7 pi over 6 union 11 pi over 6 to 2 pi. And notice that I put brackets around the 0 and 2 pi because at these endpoints, it is actually, the, the graph is actually decreasing at 0 and it's actually decreasing at 2 pi. If I were to include things like negative pi over 6, then I would have a different story. But for 0 to 2 pi, this is what we have. Now let's take a second derivative. Second derivative, let me rewrite the first derivative. That was negative, what was that derivative? Negative 2 sine of x minus 1 all over 2 plus sine of x squared. I use the quotient rule for the second derivative. It's going to be heavy, so I'm putting, giving myself some space. All right, remember, as before, Take the derivative of the numerator, I'll get negative 2 cosine of x. Li, and then multiply by the denominator, 2 plus sine of x squared minus, now be careful with your parentheses, I'm going to leave the numerator alone. So I have negative 2 sine of x minus 1, and now the derivative of the denominator. Notice that it's to the second power, so you've got to apply the power rule first. So you're going to get a 2 times 2 plus sine of x. But then you need to take the derivative of what's inside. The derivative of 2 plus sine of x is cosine of x. And all of this will be over 2 plus sine of x to the fourth power, because I've got to take the denominator and square it. Now, just like our another rational function we did, this isn't a rational function, but 
I'm going to be able to factor out a 2 plus sine of x from everything in the numerator and ultimately be able to cancel out one of those. So let me go and factor out a 2 plus sine of x in the numerator. What will be left when I pull it out? Well, I will have negative 2 cosine of x times 2 plus sine of x. then allow me to do a couple things at once here. This minus that's before negative 2 sine of x minus 1, I'm just going to change everything to plus here. So I have plus 2 sine of x plus 1. Then I'll, I'll have a 2 remaining and a cosine of x remaining times 2 cosine of x. And in the denominator, of course, we have 2 plus sine of x to the fourth. Now I'll be able to cancel out a 2 plus sine of x. Then let me simplify a little bit further and I'll multiply my negative 2 cosine of x through to get negative 4 cosine of x minus 2 cosine of x sine of x. Uh, for the second part, I'll get plus 4 sine of x cosine of x. Plus 2 sine of x. And all of that is over... 2 plus sine of x cubed. Let me see. What, I can do a little bit of simplifying in the numerator. Um, that plus, that should have been plus 2 cosine of x back here. So negative 4 cosine of x plus 2 cosine of x. I'll get negative 2 cosine of x. And then negative 2 cosine of x sine of x plus 4 uh, sine of x cosine of x will leave me plus 2 sine of x cosine of x all over 2 plus sine of x cubed. Now I notice that I can factor out a 2 cosine of x, and better yet I'm going to factor out a negative 2 cosine of x because you'll find it's easier to keep track of signs when things are factored than having a sum in there and trying to balance out sums. So I'm going to factor out a negative 2 cosine of x and what that will leave me is a 1 in that spot minus, I'll take the 2 and the cosine of x and that will leave me with the sine of x. All over 2 plus sine of x cubed. Now I mentioned that 2 plus sine of x is never going to equal 0, so I won't get any critical numbers from that. But I will get critical numbers from wherever the numerator is equal to 0. So let's set them equal to 0. If, if I'm going to have 0, then necessarily I would have to have cosine of x is equal to 0, or 1 minus sine of x is equal to 0. So let's see here. When cosine of x equals 0, x equals pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Now when 1 minus sine of x equals 0, I'll have 1 equals a sine of x, so x will equal pi over 2. So I just, I just repeated a critical number. So my critical numbers or f double prime, are pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Remember, it starts at 0, and it ends at 2 pi.
the easiest thing between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 to test is pi. You can, if you want, use 0 and use 2 pi because those are easier numbers. Or you, if you don't feel comfortable with that, I can always try a pi over 4 inside of the interval. And over here, I can try a 7 pi over 4 and see what happens. So, let's throw in the pi over 4 and see what happens to my second derivative. If I throw in pi over 4, cosine is positive, so negative 2 cosine of x is negative. The beautiful thing here is this 1 minus sine of x, when it's not busy being 0, is positive because the biggest sine of x can ever be is 1. So it, and the only place it's going to happen is pi over 2, and we've already marked that off, so it's not going to be 0 at any of these other places. So really, the only thing I have to pay attention to is the sine of negative 2 cosine of x. At pi over 4, cosine is positive, so this thing is negative. And it is decreasing. And then at pi, cosine of x is negative 1. So I'll have negative 2 times negative 1 be positive, so it's increasing. I, I, I do this all the time to myself. I don't know why. It's concave down. Then it's positive here, so it's concave up. So we have a point of inflection at pi over 2. Um, from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, let's try the 7 pi over 4. Again, cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant, so this whole thing is negative. And we are concave down. So I have another point of inflection at 3 pi over 2. What are the points of inflection? Well, I have to plug these numbers into the original function and find out what I get. So f of pi over 2 equals cosine, remember it's the original function, pi over 2 divided by 2 plus sine pi over 2. Well, this is 0 because cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. And I think you'll find that 3 pi over 2, the same thing happens. So my points of inflection, my POIs, are pi over 2 comma 0 and a 3 pi over 2 comma 0. We are concave up. on the interval from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And we're concave down on everywhere else. So concave down. On 0 to pi over 2 union. 3 pi over 2 comma 2 pi. Notice that I'm including 0 and 2 pi because the function is in the process of being concave down at both of these numbers. So I think I have enough information here to draw me a rough sketch. And of course we always check with a computer program to see how well I've done. So what I'm going to do, I think whenever you're graphing a trig function and you're trying to do it by hand, it's probably best to like keep dividing things in two. So I'm going to have this be a pi over two. I'm going to be a three pi over two here. These are important points because these are these are the places where you have points of inflection. I know the curve passes through zero through pi over two and three pi over two. Those were actually intercepts also, besides being points of inflection. Um, 0, 1 half was the y-intercept, so I'll put a dot there. Let's see what else we have. I'm concave up, uh, concave down from 0 to pi over 2, so it must be doing something like this. Concave down. Concave down, uh, concave up between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And I wonder if I have a local min at pi or somewhere around that. I don't know, know if it was at pi. Go back, go back. 
I have a local min at 7 pi over 6. 7 pi over 6 is just beyond pi. And the point was negative radical 3 over 3, the y value was. So let me go ahead and graph that point. Okay, so somehow, and, and I'm going to be concave up between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So I've got to somehow go like this, try to indicate that it's, it's, it's concave up, and then get to here. So it's concave up there. Then I'm supposed to go concave down. And I'll also reach a max of 7 pi over 11. No, 11 pi over 6. I'll have something in 11 pi over 6. I'll have a maximum of radical 3 over 3. So I'll come and do something like this. It's got to be concave down now from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. Try to reach that guy there. And then I know at 2 pi, it's the same thing that it was at 0. Oops. Which was 1 half. f of 2 pi is 1 half. So what we have then is here's, here's a complete graph of it. I, I don't know. How, I mean, my scaling and things like that could possibly be off. But this is pretty much what I'm expecting. Now, if I wanted to continue, I would just copy this again and paste it to the end of it or paste it beforehand and just rename these numbers. By the way, what is my range now that we've got it? The range equals bracket negative radical 3 over 3 comma radical 3 over 3. So let me get a graph of it. Let me put it, see if I can put it right below it. We'll see how well I did. All right, here's a graph of the function. You'll have to try to bear with me. The way this looks is not so great. I guess this looks more straight line down than mine. Mine probably because of uh, what I'm doing as far as graphing. I, I intended to, to make it look concave down, but it's, it's not terribly off. The max and mins... I think you can see, look here, 7 pi over 6, we've got a minimum, which matches my minimum. At 11 pi over 6, we have a maximum, which matches my maximum. And the concavity is a little hard to tell, just because, I mean, you can certainly tell this is concave down here, and this is concave up, but along this line, it's hard to say. According to the stuff we did, the point of inflection is at 0 pi over 2, so we put a dot there. That is a POI. And then we had one at 3 pi over 2. There was another POI. So we are concave down, although it looks kind of flat. We're concave down and then we're concave up. Then at 7 pi over 6, this decimal here is really should be labeled as negative radical 3 over 3. And up here, this one should be radical 3 over 3, so that you can see that I have a local maximum happening at pi over 6 and radical 3 over 3, and a local minimum happening at 7 pi over 6, radical 3 over 3. Um, I had a y-intercept of 1 half, well, 0 comma 1 half, and I think this gives us all we need to know because it's clear to anybody that if I put a point of inflection right here and I don't say anything else until back here, then it's pretty clear that this part of the graph should tell you this is a concave down section and this part of the graph is a concave up section. And what I've done, my graph went from 0 to 2 pi. That would be from here to here. But if you wanted, you can just paste the same graph again in behind it and paste it again ahead of it. Just change these numbers down here to whatever the number was plus 2 pi. By the way, I, I can also tell that since we have one complete period at 
has to take all the way from 0 to 2 pi. I now know the period of the original function was 2 pi and not anything smaller.